Thank you for joining our Debbie Stream Foundation Caring Stomach Cancer webinar on the role of clinical trials for cancer patients. Clinical trials are the primary means by which new cancer treatments are developed, tested, and approved. In this webinar, you will learn why a clinical trial may be right for you, understand the different phases and common terms used in clinical trials, and hear tips on talking to your doctor about your clinical trial options. I am Mary Margaret Kilmeyer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am the Patient Resource Manager for Debbie Stream Foundation Caring Stomach Cancer. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and currently completing my doctorate. My clinical and research background is focused on working collaboratively with doctors, patients, their families, and members of a healthcare team. We would like to thank Genentech for providing funding to make this webinar possible. We would also like to thank our promotional partners, the American Association for Cancer Research, the Anti-Cancer Club, Cure Magazine, the Esophageal Cancer Action Network, Meals to Heal, and Patient Resources. You will be able to ask questions during this presentation. You can type your question into the white text box that appears on your screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will address questions as time allows. If we don't have time to address your question, we will try to answer it during our next webinar taking place on June 10th at 1245 Eastern Time. In addition, the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in approximately one week. Now I will introduce Debbie Zellman, who will share with you her journey and information about Debbie's Dream Foundation, and Dr. Martin McCarter will present clinical trials for the cancer patient. And then there will be a time for questions and answers at the end. I would now like to introduce the president and founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation, Debbie Zellman. Thank you, Mary Margaret, and welcome, everyone. Um, Mary Margaret, I am noticing the slides aren't advancing. Are they advancing on your screen? My apologies. They should be live right now. A okay. little IT difficulty today. My so again, welcome and um, just to kind of give everyone a background on me, I was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. At that time, 
I was 40 years old, a mother of three young children, married to a physician and a practicing attorney with my own firm. I had no risk factors for stomach cancer and my symptoms were very vague. My chances of being alive in five years was only 4%. However, I can tell you that it has now been seven years since my diagnosis. And during that seven years, I have had five recurrences. Bottom line is I am still a patient. I do receive chemo regularly. Next slide. In April of 2009, I founded Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. And I have become a staunch advocate for stomach cancer including serving on the National Cancer Institute Esophagogastric Task Force, the NCCN Gastric and Esophageal Guidelines Committee, the Department of Defense Peer Review Cancer Research Program Integration Panel, the ASCO HER2 Testing Guidelines Gastric Cancer Project, the National Cancer Institute Patient Advocacy Steering Committee, and the American Cancer Society Research Stakeholder Program. Debbie's Dream Foundation is also a member of the Deadliest Cancers Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. But people tell me my most notable achievement is that I appeared on Dr. Oz in a program about stomach cancer. Next slide. So here are some facts about stomach cancer. Stomach cancer, unfortunately, is one of the leading causes of cancer death worldwide, second in men and fourth in women. Each year, nearly a million people will be diagnosed with stomach cancer and approximately 700,000 will die. More than 24,000 Americans will be diagnosed with stomach cancer each year, and 11,000 will die that same year. Unfortunately, stomach cancer is on the rise in young people ages 25 to 39. However, per cancer death, stomach cancer receives the least amount of federal research funding of any cancer. When I was diagnosed, there were few resources and support services for stomach cancer patients, and most people knew very little about this deadly disease. Next slide. However, I started the foundation to change that. Our mission as a nonprofit is to raise awareness about stomach cancer, advance funding for research, and provide education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. We seek 
as our ultimate goal to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. Our website is debbiesdream.org. Next slide. In our six years, we have achieved many milestones, including a free patient resource education program, abbreviated PrEP. And PrEP helps hundreds of patients, families, and caregivers throughout the world, matching inquirers with other survivors and caregivers using specific disease criteria like stage, biomarker, age, gender, and region. We also hold free stomach cancer education symposia and webinars like this throughout the year. Our most recent symposium was April 18th, and those lectures should be available shortly on our website. We have 26 chapters in the United States, Canada, and Germany, and events across the United States. We have given $150,000 in research grant funding. And most notably is our advocacy. We are the only stomach cancer advocacy uh, in the United States and across the world that we know of. We have had Three Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Days and the first ever Capitol Hill Briefing. We were so successful that we were able to add stomach cancer to a $50 million pot of money available through the department. Department of Defense Peer Review Cancer Research Program. In addition, as I mentioned, our website, debbiestream.org, is a very in depth place for education, including information about stomach cancer, a lecture library clinical trial information and a free matching service, a very unique stomach cancer support community, in fact, it's the only one of its kind. We have a blog and resources which are completely translatable into more than 60 languages. Next slide. Here's a look at our homepage of our website. Very easily navigable and very rich in information. And if you look there, there's an event tab. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Next slide. So if you were to go to the event tab, these are only some of the events that you would see. We have many events, but just to give you a little uh, taste of what we have, we attend um, education and cancer conferences all over the country, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting in Chicago in the, at the end of May. 
that is attended by 30,000 ecology professionals from all over the world. We are participating in the National Cancer Survivors Day, which is a celebration of life on June 7th. The Chicago area is having a half marathon and 5K on September 27th, and they're also having a symposium on November 7th. We have an International Stomach Cancer Genes Day on November 13th that everybody can participate in. It's a fun and easy event. And in Miami, we have a marathon and half marathon on January 24th of 2016. I have to tell you, we also know the date of our next gala and symposium, which is April 9th, 2016. At this time, I'm going to turn the webinar back over to our wonderful moderator, Mary Margaret Kilmeyer. And again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you to our speaker. Thank you, Debbie. Debbie Stream Foundation is headquartered in Davie, Florida. Our office is open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. On this slide, you will also see important phone numbers and email addresses to contact our office. We will start the presentation on demystifying clinical trials. Our presenter is Dr. Martin McCarter. Dr. McCarter is a professor of surgery and the surgical director at the esophageal and gastric multidisciplinary cancer clinic at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He received his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Vermont and completed a fellowship in surgical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Martin Dr. McCarter's clinical focus is on minimally invasive treatments of gastrointestinal tumors and complex abdominal operations. He is actively involved in research to understand the relationship between tumors and the patient's immune response. Martin is involved in clinical and translational trials and published on related topics. In addition, he is a member of the Debbie Stream Foundation Medical Advisory Board. At this time, I will turn the webinar over to Dr. McCarter. Thank you very much, Mary Margaret, uh, and I'm honored to be here today uh, talking about demystifying clinical trials. I thought what I'd like to do is just uh, try to address some thoughts and concerns that uh, people may have about clinical trials. and hopefully answer some of those questions. Uh, I'm going to start by you know, just trying to talk about what a clinical trial is. And clinical trial really is a way to test an idea that one treatment is better than another. 
or possibly that two treatments are equal. Sometimes we don't want to find out if it's better, but just maybe there's um, a better side effect profile, better tolerated, lower costs associated with it. The clinical trial really is designed to answer a specific question, um, and it is uh, built around a very standardized approach so that we can equally compare treatments uh, across patients and across groups, across time, really is our best way to allow for a fair comparison between different treatments. Next slide. The um, I would also address a few of some terms throughout this uh, seminar. And the uh, first one here is just to talk about standard therapy. You may hear this term uh, used once in a while. And really, this just refers to uh, a commonly applied treatment for a common uh, condition or disease. There can be more than one standard uh, of therapy, but in general, this is what most reasonable physicians would consider as a, a good treatment. We also, we also we also hear the term standard of care, and that would be a similar term. Most clinical trials uh, aim to compare a standard therapy or add on to a standard therapy. So we start with the standard care as our baseline. Next slide. Experimental therapy is the treatment that we are testing. And this refers to a new type of treatment that is being developed. Uh, usually, this treatment has some very solid scientific rationale that gets it to this level. And it's usually developed in the laboratory and in animal uh, experiments before it is brought to human uh, clinical trials. Experimental therapy it can be many different uh, types of treatment, but often it's a new therapy or it's a combination of therapy. And often, you know, starting again from what we had as our standard. Next slide. So why do we need clinical trials? Well, really, if we had all the answers already and thought we had this, uh, all treatments worked out, then we wouldn't need them. But the reality is that there is much room to improve on existing treatments. And this is true of virtually all medical conditions. There's a concept out there uh, called equipoise. And equipoise means 
when we reach the period of equilibrium where we don't really know if one treatment is better than another. And, and that's what, one of the reasons we need clinical trials. If we've got a couple of ideas on what treatments might be effective, but we really haven't been able to directly compare them, that's a good time to investigate a clinical trial. Usually, we're trying to show that one treatment is better than another, although sometimes there are times when we want to show that treatments are equal. It's also important to point out that all currently FDA-approved treatments occurred via a clinical trial, and I'll come back to this at the end, but it's a very important uh, step in the process of improving care. Next slide. Now, there are some flaws in um, historic comparisons. Many people ask, why do we need to keep doing these trials? We know what you know the disease process used to be a few years ago. Why do we have to compare? Well, the reality is that so much is changing and evolving rapidly that it's very unfair fair to look back uh, and compare to a historic group of patients. And that's because our treatments change, our standards of care change, even what we call best supportive care, uh, just maintenance care uh, changes over time. Other things change too, such as technology, our way of diagnosing, for example, tumors or other diseases changes. Uh, and specifically in, in the cancer world, our, our staging system changes. It, it's designed to uh, group patients uh, in you know various levels of cancer um, disease states, but the reality is that our, our technology changes so fast that um, we you know can sometimes end up with the diagnosis now of a certain stage that might have been staged in a whole different stage in the past. And so comparing in retrospect doesn't really work very well. And then our screening and surveillance uh, techniques change over time as well. So really, um, as as much as we'd like to use the historic comparisons, they're a rough guideline. They don't really give us uh, the answers we need. Next slide. Many patients ask about, you know, uh, animal studies and can't we work this all out in animals? And, and the reality is that uh, animal studies are very helpful for us. They, they really get us to the level of investigating something that might be helpful in humans. But there are a number of important things to point out about the animal studies, and that is that uh, 
all the animals that we use in the laboratory are necessarily genetically inbred. And because of that, um, they're a very uniform group, and it's, it doesn't really represent the differences that we would see across a spectrum of humanity. And likewise, the cancer cell lines that we use in the laboratory also are very uniform. They're very unique. They grow very specifically in a, uh, that condition, but that is also quite different than the actual tumors that we see in human beings. So both are very are important, but really don't give us all the answers we need. And that's another reason we need clinical trials. Next slide. So when should a clinical trial be performed? Well, in general, uh, we we think of running a clinical trial when there is sufficient evidence from laboratory studies that would suggest we have a new treatment that might be better than what we had before. So clinical trials often uh, get performed because we develop new agents that look like they might be more promising than previous te uh, technology. We have new techniques, uh, new approaches to diagnosing a tumor or staging it. We have new technology, new imaging, new uh, uh, tests that are available, and all of those would be good reasons to uh, run a trial to compare the new technology to what we had before. And then even, you know, uh, as new treatments come online, they're often developed as a single agent of treatment, but the reality is that we often combine treatments now for different diseases, and a clinical trial can be run when we want to combine some of these agents that previously hadn't been combined. Next slide. Uh, there are many different phases of clinical trials, and we basically break these down into three separate phases, each of which have a different goal, and I'll, I'll walk through these as well. So as the agents are being developed in the very early stages, they're worked out in uh, the laboratory and animal models. When it, we have something that looks promising for human application, in general, the first line of treatment is the first phase of treatment is called a phase one clinical trial, and these are usually the first or nearly the first times that these are used in human beings. And the reality is that the focus of a phase one clinical trial is on safety, because we've had many agents come through the pipeline that look promising in the laboratory, but uh, we're not safe to give to humans. And we, we didn't find that out, of course, until you try a human, but you don't want to expose a whole number of patients to that until you know it's safe. And that's really the first goal. 
you might get a little signal about how effective it might be, but really we we're finding out can we safely do this in humans. If it passes that test, uh, it then moves on to what's called a phase two clinical trial. And the primary goal of a phase two trial is to test the dose of the drug or the application of a device. So now that we show that it's relatively safe, we want to find out what dose should be used or how often it should be given. And um, so that phase two will involve a few more patients trying to work out what the uh, optimal dose will be. At the same time, we will try to gather some data on uh, how effective it is. And we're certainly looking for any signal that says, yeah, this is, is fairly effective against whatever target we're trying to hit. So once we develop a drug that's safe and looks like it's going to have some promising signal, then it moves on to the phase three clinical trial. And, and these are really the gold standard for uh, getting a new therapy applied or uh, approved for use in humans. Phase three clinical trials tend to be much larger, involve hundreds of patients or sometimes thousands of patients. Um, and they are uh, designed to compare the new treatment to the standard treatment in relationship to a primary endpoint. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on, but the primary endpoint is usually how effective is this uh, in that particular patient group. Phase three clinical trials tend to be national, wide-ranging, very large, uh, complex undertaking. Next slide, please. So when it comes to clinical trial design, uh, the, there are a number of different terms that we use uh, and apply for a variety of reasons. You may hear these terms used. Uh, a randomized clinical trial, and that implies a process whereby uh, patients who once uh, they're determined to be eligible for a trial, they're then randomized into one or two or maybe three, one of four different groups Um, and the, the process of randomization is, is just that, it's generated by a computer and the idea is that we spread out any of the variability that might be inherent in the population across the groups so that the groups can be equally compared. Another way to reduce some of the bias is to use a placebo. And although there's a lot of uh, discussion about the use of placebos, they, they actually are quite uh, 
useful. And some of the examples of that are we, we might have a new drug coming along. We, and we decide we're going to give patients standard of care and add that new drug, a new pill, for example, to the treatment. We want to compare that to the standard of care in other people, but we want to give them a placebo pill as well. And the reason is that we're already starting from the standard of care, and you're adding that placebo as a direct comparator to the new agent being added. And this way, you can really try to determine does that new drug truly add to the benefit or what we think is going to be a benefit of it. Another uh, way we uh, reduce the bias is by blinding the study. And the blinded part of the study could be uh, blinded to the patient, could be blinded to the investigator or physician, or could be blinded to both of them something called a double blind study. And this is another way where you know you make two identical pills look exactly the same. And the idea is that you know the patient or the physician don't really know which one they're getting. And that really gives us the very best way to be as unbiased as possible about determining side effects and treatment effects, uh, you know, potentially response rates and that kind of thing. And then there are other uh, ways of doing trials, including something called an observational trial, where we might, you know, either randomize or just not randomize, but follow patients who went down one path of treatment versus another path and try to learn from that. In general, observational trials don't have the power that uh, the randomized blinded placebo control trials have, but it does give some uh, preliminary information on what might be effective therapy. Next slide, please. So as part of the clinical trial design, we take into some um, account of statistical considerations. And this is uh, to determine how many patients should be entered into a trial. Um, and we want to make sure that there are enough patients in there to answer the question being asked. I also want to make sure that, uh, well, we also know that the number of patients will depend on the phase of the study. Very early phase one studies typically have uh, a handful of patients in them. Phase two, a few more, but probably less than 100, and then phase three, uh, over 100 patients in general. The number of patients also depends on what the expected outcome is. If you have a treatment that has uh, a huge leap forward and expect a huge you know, benefit, then you might not need as many patients to show that benefit. 
on the, if on the other hand, you have a, an agent that you know might improve response rates by you know five or ten percent, then you'll need more patients to be able to show that it's actually beneficial. And then there are other trial designs uh, known as uh, equivalence trials or superior superiority trials. Uh, and there are different statistical considerations that go into those trial designs. Next slide. Now, one of the big um, concerns about clinical trials is the overall safety. And I think when patients think about clinical trials, they're concerned are, you know, am I being a, a guinea pig or am I being exposed to unnecessary risk? So a great deal of effort goes into designing clinical trials to make them as safe as possible. And one way we do this is by standard, starting with the standard of care, uh, and then adding to it. So we will all make sure they're getting what we consider adequate care, uh, but we also, when we add to it, we want to make sure they're not being harmed by whatever we're adding. And so the trial design really is meant to protect the patients from uh, potential harm. And yes, many agents potentially could have harm, so we want to uh, build in some security mechanisms to try to minimize that potential harm. It, all of this regulation uh, functions as a check in the system, and, and trials really uh, build in a great deal of extra safety evaluations. And I, and I tell many patients I think it's actually a benefit in many ways to be on trials because there are extra uh, imaging or lab draws or exams built in to be certain that um, the agent is not causing more harm, or if it is, to be able to uh, intervene very early on. Next slide. So speaking of regulation, um, there is a great deal of regulation that goes into these trials, and that comes at a number of different levels. Uh, the first level is at the, what is called the local IRB, or Institutional Review Board. So every trial is run through an institution that has a group of people that evaluate that trial to say, yeah, this is a reasonable uh, thing to do. They also check to make sure that the safety checks are built into the system. And if it's approved at the local level, uh, then it's allowed to go ahead. There are other safety mechanisms and something called the data, data safety monitoring board is often built into uh, trials where they have an independent group of uh, physicians or researchers who evaluate the safety data as it comes out of the trial. And 
their job is to determine is there some subtle signal here that others might be missing or in aggregate now can we see patterns can we uh, make some recommendations back to the group of ways to improve the safety of the trial and make sure that uh, again, patients aren't being harmed, and sometimes if there's a great benefit being detected early in a study, the safety monitoring board will stop the study early so that more patients can be uh, treated with the beneficial therapy. And then there are, of course, national agencies that regulate this as well, the FDA being uh, the most common one. Next slide. The informed consent process uh, for clinical trials is uh, intimate to it and a very important part. And the consent explains the why, what, how, effects, and risks of the study. And so it's a detailed document that explains why the study is being done, and what the agents are that are being tested, how they're likely to affect you and what the expected side effects may be. And it walks to general risks and benefits of that type of uh, treatment. Next slide. Clinical trials are uh, designed around a primary endpoint, and this is, uh, in general, you know, I talked about some of the safety endpoints, but for phase three trials, the, the primary endpoint often is something big, like overall survival or response rate. And the statistical consideration of the trial is built around whatever we pick as that primary big endpoint. Now, trials might have a bunch of other secondary endpoints that we're also very interested in, but you have to pick something that your primary target is. And Again, survival response rates are some of the big ones we do, but other things like quality of life would be a reasonable endpoint as well. Next slide. Other focuses of clinical trials include uh, the treatment modality. And uh, I've listed several here, including chemotherapy trials, uh, which I'll speak a, a little bit more about here in a minute. Radiation trials might be trying to design uh, different uh, types of radiation or timing and delivery of radiation or combination with chemotherapy uh, type trials. We have a bunch of different surgical trials that might try a new approach to surgery or different technique or minimizing the operation and determining how safe and effective that could be. We have different devices, and we're constantly developing newer uh, devices for diagnosing and uh, biopsying things. And we want to know how effective those are. 
and then we have other uh, types of trials, treatment modality trials run by, which might be as simple as a palliative care trial where we're trying to uh, improve the overall quality of life with, while minimizing any potential uh, side effects or harms. Next slide, please. So talking about chemotherapy trials, these are some of the more common types. And most commonly, we're comparing one drug to another. But sometimes we're adding you know, one drug to a historic uh, treatment algorithm. Often, we'll compare rooted delivery. Uh, in newer agents now uh, are being developed that can be uh, taken as a pill form as opposed to the intravenous route. And uh, we're trying to determine is one better than the other. We'll be comparing different combination of therapies. We got. Um, let's say, uh, a number of drugs that are active against one particular tumor, we're going to combine several of those drugs and see if we can improve the overall response. And then now we're also uh, focusing on a lot of targeted therapy where we're analyzing the tumor for its molecular signature and then picking off the shelf uh, whatever drugs are available that would specifically target that uh, molecular mutation, for example. Next slide, please. Recently, there's been a large interest in uh, immunotherapy trials. And one of the interesting uh, components of this is that our historic um, assessment of responses might need to be changed based on immunotherapy trials. In general, immunotherapy trials are designed to enhance the patient's own immune response to a tumor. And this immunotherapy might be uh, something like a vaccine, or it might be an antibody, or it might be some uh, cells taken out of the patient and, and put back in the patient. They're often combined with other treatment uh, as well. The interesting thing is that uh, the traditional measurements of response differ for immunotherapy trials. And we are still in the process of trying to work out what is the best way to monitor somebody on an immune therapy trial? There are different ex expected toxicities as well. As you can imagine, uh, you know, it, immune responses uh, are, are quite different than a patient's response to uh, chemotherapy. Next slide, please. There are a number of different types of clinical trials in addition to the things that I've already mentioned. And uh, what I'm speaking about here in particular are uh, the differences between what's Consider a national cooperative group trial and some other types. 
So a national cooperative group trial is generally where a, a group of uh, medical societies have, have gotten together and said, yes, this is some agent that looks promising enough that we need to test it across the entire country. And so a national group will get behind it and support a running that trial. There are other types of trials and things called industry sponsored trials where a company has developed a new device or a new drug they uh, want to sponsor and see if that truly is going to be effective. And so they will approach uh, some institutions to try to develop uh, a sponsored trial by that company. And there are investigator initiated trials where an investigator has developed some newer uh, techniques, let's say, worked out of a laboratory that may not have industry backing or national backing, but look promising enough to run as a local uh, clinical trial, and if that's successful, then it might be elevated to a more a national level. Next slide, please. Now, many patients ask me about complementary and alternative medicine, and the other half that don't ask me are already uh, doing it or looking at it, so you might as well be upfront about that. Um, and we know, as physicians, we know most patients are at least investigating it. You know, as far as clinical trials and complementary or alternative medicines goes, um, it's a, a tricky area because um, most complementary and alternative medicines by themselves have not been subjected to the same rigor that many of the agents that we use uh, are used today. It's been a little more push to try to get some of this uh, studied in an effective manner. But as you can imagine, it's, it's a little bit um, challenging because uh, we really have little data or, or uh, experience to guide us right now. And um, the, there are a lot of challenges in trying to standardize the complementary medicine, where it comes from, how it's delivered, who's using it, and those kind of things. So it's not to say we shouldn't or can't be doing it, but it does represent some of the challenges. Next slide, please. A lot of patients ask about the eligibility for clinical trials, and this is often a, a bit of a touchy point because um, there's, there are competing interests here. Uh, from the clinical trial design standpoint, uh, most trials try to limit uh, patients to a relatively uniform group with uniform tumors and with specific features. 
Uh, and the reason that is done is to reduce as much variability as possible and to create a relative uniform group. Um, the other potential benefit here is that uh, by making patients as sort of uniform as possible, you can kind of control and minimize the amount of toxicity that might be associated with a treatment. Um, there's also some thought that by making that a very select group, you could potentially increase the chance of showing the benefit in that select group. Uh, and I know patients are often disappointed to find out they're not eligible for this, that, or the other trial. Uh, but again, it's, it's largely built around you know, trying to be as safe as possible and to get as much useful information as possible out of it. Next slide, please. So what about uh, talking to others for clinical trials? And this, I, I can't emphasize this enough. I think a number, you know, patients have an inherent concern or a question about a current trial. Is it the right thing for me to do? And I would really encourage um, those considering trials to talk to uh, other patients that have been uh, through clinical trials. Uh, or even talk to their physicians, talk to non-biased, non-treating physicians, maybe, you know, a friend of a friend kind of thing, and just pass it by them, get some input on, is this something that's worth considering? And then I'd also recommend tapping into the patient advocacy groups, and uh, Debbie's Dream Foundation is an excellent example of this, uh, of a very focused group on uh, gastric cancer, and they can uh, put you in touch with not only what trials are around, but, you know, patients that have been through this and give you some um, sense of what a trial is. I think the vast majority of patients who go through the trials really are grateful to be a part of that. Next slide. So how do I find out about clinical trials? Um, if this is for my condition, well, uh, you can, again, start with your treating physician, but there are a number of uh, ways to search this on the web, uh, looking at local institutions, uh, might have some clinical trials, uh, the disease site average advocacy groups, again, like Debbie's Dream Foundation is very good about uh, gastric cancer trials that might be eligible, uh, available wherever they are. And then the national government has a clinicaltrials.gov website, which is uh, the clearinghouse, if you will, of all trials. Uh, registered with the government, and, and this covers the entire country and sometimes uh, places outside the country as well. Uh, it's a great resource. 
lots of functionality in terms of how to narrow uh, a search down. Next slide. So as we get uh, near the end here, uh, I wanted to give you an example of a clinical trial that changed the way we treat, in this case, gastric cancer patients. And this is the uh, what's called the MAGIC trial, and uh, us physicians spend a lot of time trying to come up with a clever acronym for these trials, and this one is one of those. Um, it really has nothing to do with magic, but it has everything to do with gastric cancer, and that's what the G is in there for. And, and basically, this was a trial uh, that was one where we didn't know what the best treatment is. Lots of patients were getting different types of approaches to chemotherapy and surgery. But finally got around to organizing a trial where we randomized patients to receive uh, chemotherapy for three cycles before surgery, have the operation, and then have three more cycles of chemotherapy after, versus at the time the standard of care was just surgery alone. And, it turned, and the agents that were used in this particular case uh, were epirubicin, cisplatin, and 5-FU. Uh, and the primary endpoint for this trial was overall survival. And you can see from the survival curves there that the treatment group in red had an improvement in five-year overall survival compared to the treatment group in, uh, to the surgery alone group in blue. And this fundamentally changed the way we uh, approach these tumors. For the vast majority of gastric cancers, uh, the patients would be eligible for uh, this type of treatment before chemotherapy before and after an operation. Now, there are some patients that were excluded, very early cancers, so it's not appropriate for everybody. But um, it just shows you uh, what these kind of trials can do in terms of moving the curve forward, improving overall survival for everybody. And you know, some look at that and say that's a small benefit. Those of us in the field look at that and say that's a huge benefit. And every year we hope to make some small incremental benefits beyond that. Next slide. I'm going to skip the next slide because it's just the redundancy of this. And I'll go to uh, the next last slide, which is why are clinical trials so important? Well, the answer is that if we already had the cure, we wouldn't need them. But the reality is we don't have the cure for most. And so we still need to uh, make improvements. It really is the only proven way to improve outcomes. And it's, uh, I'm going to point out again that it's uh, all currently FDA-approved medications went through this trial process first to 
demonstrate that they are safe and also to demonstrate that they are effective. So uh, clinical trials really are the way we are going to continue to make improvements. And if you look back over the last decade, we've had huge improvements in the last decade in the way we treat cancers and many other things. If you look back over the last century, you know, it's just an asymptotic rise in the way we've done it. And this is done by the steady incremental uh, clinical trial process. Last slide. I uh, just want to a quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Jimmy Valvano uh, about never giving up, and that is to show or to say that, uh, you know, many patients get into a, a very advanced disease and Things are looking pretty dire, but we uh, often should be considering uh, clinical trials as a way to try to not only help them, but potentially help other patients in the future. Uh, and with that, I will end and be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for that presentation and valuable information, Dr. McCarter. I will now begin reading some of the questions that we've received during the presentation. And the first question is to please explain the difference between complementary and alternative medicine. Well, they're, they're actually um, kind of some overlap between those two, but uh, so complementary uh, medicine would be, in general, uh, something added on to standard of care, and, and it can be anything from, uh, you know, vitamins to diet to nutrition. Uh, you know, acupuncture. So there are many, many ways to complement your uh, standard treatment. Um, alternative therapies tend to be a little more on the extreme side. So, uh, you know, Some people may have heard of you know, extreme um, vitamin infusions or detoxifications, cleansings, um, and you know I kind of view many of those as more uh, on the alternative side. Uh, again, it, it's not to say that they may may they may not uh, they may be harmful, but we just don't know enough uh, about them, and that's the one concern that we have is you know if you're going to be uh, 
doing some of those things, I think it's wise to discuss it with your physician just to make sure that there's no um, potential added harm by adding those types of things to the standard of treatment. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is two part. Is it possible to get a drug that is being used in a clinical trial if the patient is not enrolled? And then also, is it possible um, or could you discuss the use of drugs for off-label purposes? Okay. So, yeah, so um, getting access to drugs uh, and not being enrolled in clinical trial, it's often difficult to do that. Uh, but, but there are a few mechanisms, mechanisms, potential to do so. And uh, there are some uh, appeal processes, something called compassionate use, where you know, something might look fairly promising, but it hasn't been FDA approved yet. And somebody's run through all the other standard treatments. Um, there are ways to potentially get access to it. Now, there are a number of issues with that because many of the pharmaceutical companies don't want. Uh, drugs to be used outside of trials because they don't have control over it and they're concerned that there may be some adverse effects if not used uh, properly. Um, and, you know, a direct appeal to the company uh, can be made uh, as well. As, as far as the, I'm sorry, the second question, I forgot. Sorry. The use of off label. Um, uh, yeah. So, as you probably no, uh, many drugs are used off-label, um, but they really can't be accessed or used off-label until they have at least one FDA-approved indication and can be then be generally available. Again, the, the primary goal uh, when these all started out was safety. So, in, in when drugs are being used off label, people start to worry a little bit about the safety profile because it hasn't necessarily been used in whatever that off label condition is. On the other hand, we at least have some data to say in this whatever group of patients it was safe and therefore might be reasonable to try as an off-label situation. It turns out that many, many, many drugs are commonly used off-label it's not to say we shouldn't or can't be doing that, but we just have to be a little bit more aware of the potential unknown effects. Okay, thank you. And um, we 
have time for one more question. Is that would be would my trial doctor collaborate with my oncologist if they aren't the same physician, or would they also collaborate with other members of my healthcare team? That's an excellent question, and I know a lot of patients, you know, wonder about that, and if they don't ask it, they certainly are uh, concerned. But uh, the reality is that uh, I, most of us in, in the business of medicine would say there's a clinical trial uh, that the patient is eligible for, it, it would be very well worthwhile supporting that and including your local physician. And, you know, we work with uh, community doctors all the time and, and back and forth with the patient trying to figure out what the best treatment is and if they're on a clinical trial, some of that has to be done, you know, locally, but much of it can be done uh, with their local physician and that local physician, A, generally knows the patient best and B, is often able to intervene or deal with uh, potential problems early on as, a, as opposed to having to wait to get back to the organization that's running the trial. So I think it's vital to include that uh, primary oncologist uh, in the whole uh, decision-making process. Excellent. Thank you so much again for your responses to those questions as well as the presentation. As you know, this webinar was brought to you by Debbie String Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. Thank you to Debbie Zellman, President and Founder, our speaker, Dr. Martin McCarter from the University of Colorado, and to Genentech for making the provide or for providing the funding that helped make this webinar possible. As you see on your screen, we have upcoming events to get involved in and support. Details about these events are available on our website, Debbie's Dream Foundation, www.debbiesdream.org. And thank you to all of our listeners today. Our next nutrition webinar will be held on June 10th at 1245 Eastern Time. We would love to hear your feedback, questions, and thoughts before then. Please send your comments to patient.resource at Debbie's Thank you.